Uh, thank you, Luis, for the introduction. Uh, hello, and welcome to our presentation of From Scratch to Self-Service Architecture, almost, or Lessons Learned Building and Growing a New Enterprise Architecture Program Focused on Cultivating Business Engagement. A quick area overview of the areas we'll be covering today, starting with the journey, a glimpse of our motivations and methods, a discussion of frameworks and meta models, business engagement and how we cultivate it, self-service architecture, how we define it and how it contributes to our success. Roughly 10 to 15 minutes is reserved at the end for discussion. My name is Chris Pugrud. I'm a member of the Enterprise Architecture team here at First Interstate Bank, and I've been here for roughly two and a half years. My primary background is security architecture and engineering for sensitive global systems. My approach to enterprise architecture is very technical. My name is Tyson Dye. I'm also on the enterprise architecting team here. Um, I have an EMEA background where I spent uh, 10 years in the UK with a large hosting company out there doing cloud architecture product development on hosted solutions. Thank you, Tyson. We'd also like to acknowledge our colleagues who contributed to improving this presentation. Charles Heineman, Jeff Moore, and Cade Peterson. Short disclaimer everyone should be familiar with. All opinions expressed or implied in this presentation are those of the presenter. They do not necessarily reflect the views of First Interstate Bank or Evolution. First Interstate Bank was established in 1968 and currently has 148 branches across six states. With over 14 billion in assets under management, we're a regional bank with community focus. Our current team came together roughly two years ago. Almost three years ago, we were offered the opportunity to clean the slate and start a new enterprise architecture program from scratch. We took some time to dig deep and think about the lessons we'd learned previously and how we felt we could try something different. Our thoughts were strongly influenced by the Agile and DevOps communities. The first step of our journey was to clearly express what we wanted our group to achieve and how it would fit within the organization. Part of our strategic vision can be expressed as three key goals. Deliver value. This should not need to be said, but I, I put it here to focus conversations around the goal. Of what can we do to provide value to the other parts of the organization? Create engagement. We create engagement through listening to business challenges and thinking about ways we can help with the tools that we have. Simplify process. We look for ways to use EA to reduce friction and accelerate change. The inspiration we borrowed from the agile DevOps and rapid development communities informed our strategy. You can see four of these strategic principles, the simplicity, agility, innovative, and open, arranged around an example, our, our enterprise dashboard that demonstrates the combination of these strategies. The first of these, simplicity, is a guiding principle that really sits at the core of how we approach enterprise architecture. I'll be diving deeper into agility and simplicity in the next slide. Innovation, that drive to continuously try new things, to, to fail fast and fail often, is part of our engagement strategy. And openness, openly sharing our repository, is part of our self-service architecture approach. Both innovation and openness will be discussed by Tyson shortly. What do we mean by simplicity and agility? Only what you need, only when you need it. Diagrams must speak to the intended audience. Don't distract your audience with excessive detail. There's a need and an audience for technically complete diagrams. But most of the time, you need to communicate quickly and easily with minimal detail and distraction. Our colleague Charles likes to ask, what's the question you're trying to answer? Focus on gathering just the information you need to answer the current question. One source of inspiration is the linked article, Service-Oriented Architecture and the Michelin Man. The Michelin Man has really helped us to expand our meta model as we matured to capture additional nuance as necessary. On the left, you can start as we did with just applications and discovering departments and enumerating the servers those applications live on. The cap, 
excuse me, the combination of application and department begins to eliminate the processes that need to be documented. This incremental growth keeps us focused on the elements that are most important to the business at the moment and gives a foundation to grow as we mature into documenting services and capabilities. At the beginning of the day, the most important thing is that you start somewhere. For us, the best place to start was applications. Why? Every part of the business has a list of applications that are important to them. What makes it challenging? Every part of the business has a list of applications that are important to them, and none of them agree. Every part of the business has a different perspective and a different definition of application. Merging these competing priorities from different parts of the business and providing a consistent source of record for applications is an opportunity for enterprise architecture to shine and provide value back to the organization as a whole. Meshing together competing data sets and developing consistent scales of measurement are the real challenge. You have to continuously review data lifecycle and develop consistent processes. As you can see on the far right, we have many application catalogs. Each one is tailored to a specific purpose and audience. Sorbanes-Oxley, disaster recovery, systems administration. I encourage you to use the flexibility of the software to create tailored views of your data focused on the needs of specific audiences. The lesson learned behind each of these bespoke catalogs is the value of a good enterprise architecture tool because the objects, applications in this example, can be viewed from many different angles. It's easy to create unique viewpoints and be assured that they're always current. You don't have to update 20 different Excel spreadsheets to change the name of a single application. Now that we've gotten started with applications, we need to add some structure to provide a roadmap for where we're going. Frameworks and the minimals that come from them provide structure and guidance, a roadmap for your long-term vision of the architecture. Based on previous experience and an examination of what was available, we chose the evolution of hybrid meta model as our starting point. The architecture needs to reflect how the organization views itself in order to be useful. Architecture is not just one size fits all, and it will take experimentation to mature a meta model that supports documentation that is useful to the organization. Best meta model is the one that best fits your organization and available data. Our meta model leverages multiple frameworks, including TOGAF, ITIL, and others. And we review additional frameworks regularly, both as inspiration for extending our own meta model and understanding the data model of external information we want to merge into our architecture. As an example, one current area of research is how to represent a security framework component in our meta model and how to connect these components in a meaningful way. George Box is famous for the saying, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. I appreciate this extended version of, from one of his later books. The focal point for me is that your model will never be complete or perfect, and you should not try to make it perfect. It's easy to get lost in the minutia of architecture and engineering and try to capture every possible detail but you'll deliver more value more quickly by focusing on, as our Charles colleague Charles likes to remind us, focus on what's the question you're trying to answer. This is our current meta model in production. The most important part of this diagram, in my mind, are the definitions along the right. We spend a lot of time making sure that we're defining things in a way that makes sense to the entire organization. We started in the middle, the applications, and worked from there to discover the departments, and the servers, and the processes connected to these applications. On the right-hand side of the slide is the Evolution Hybrid Meta Model for reference. <clears throat> A quick visual comparison will show you how heavily we've borrowed from the reference. We're in the process of adding additional components and connections as we mature. We continue to use the Abacus Meta Model for inspiration. You can see at the top of our meta model, the beginning of capabilities is the blue box. 
we're starting to expand our capabilities as we overcome the challenges of working with the business units to understand and articulate their capabilities. You can see some aspirational elements at the top of the evolution meta model, uh, such as strategy, projects, goals, and ideas that we're exploring, but we have not fully engaged with. So we haven't added them to our meta model. The story is similar at the bottom of the diagram. We have placeholders for each of these physical components, and we'd really like to doc document them in the tool, but we don't have a good data source. Data lifecycle is so critical to keep your architecture from becoming stale. We're waiting for a good CMDB to use as a data source for these technology components, so we're not manually updating data in the repository. We've made several attempts to manually pull data in and correlate it while trying to figure out how to update it with minimal effort. The problem is that without a simple process to keep everything current, your data can become stale and eventually your data becomes incorrect. The danger is that incorrect information can be worse than having no information at all. You really have to think about the life cycle and if you can maintain that information with reasonable correctness. Some examples of how we think about the meta model. If the organization cannot recognize itself in the mirror of architecture, it's the architecture that's wrong. I'm repeating myself, but that's how important I think that is. Rigid and flexible. Be rigid in the definition and usage of components and connections. Be flexible in the meta model so that you can add components and connections that best reflect the business. What's the question you're trying to answer? You only need enough data components and connections to answer your question. Your model and data will always be incomplete. Focus on what you need and have available now. Understand and articulate your uncertainties and incompleteness. The process of adding more components or changing your architecture and meta model is made much easier through evolved architectures. <clears throat> It took us about 18 months to mature into being able to take advantage of evolved architectures. Using evolved and secondary architectures really helps increase your agility, that ability to experiment, learn, and grow, be flexible, simple, and easily adaptable. As you can see in the picture, we have multiple evolved and secondary architectures active at the moment. We use these to experiment, test, and model different scenarios depending on the hypothesis. Evolved architectures are a complete copy of the parent architecture that can be modified and synchronized up or down. And they help you test changes to components or the meta model. And they're great for modeling multiple future state options. Secondary architectures, like these ones down here, are unique architectures with a shared meta model. Everything is based on the same meta model. And they're great for meta model scoping diagrams like this one here, or modeling alternative and conceptual models. Most importantly, they're fully visible in related tools such as Avix Enterprise because they are part of the same architecture. You can mix and match these architectures to achieve your goals. In the picture, you can see that I have an evolved architecture, next-gen logical network, that is evolved from a secondary architecture, current logical network. These additional architectures are used for more than internal hypothesis and experiment. Later on, Tyson will demonstrate an example of how we have used evolved and secondary architectures to provide proposed system designs and analysis. Wrapping up our exploration around the infrastructure of our enterprise architecture program, I'd like to pass the baton to Tyson to show you how we interact with the rest of the organization. Thank you, Chris. So now that we've had a chance to clean the slate, start fresh, set out some goals and some principles and start with a, a layer on the, our meta model, even establish our meta model, where did we go next? And one of the areas that we wanted to tackle was business engagement. I'll also talk about self-service architecture um, as the last segment. So what do we mean by business engagement? That's one of the first things I wanna look at. I also wanna look at why it's so important. Um, and then I wanna look at how First Interstate, we undertook it, our approach, and then a handful of examples that we can look at, discuss some lessons learned. Uh, etc. So first, what does business engagement look like? Well, it takes uh, many forms, many shapes. It's more than just having organizations approve or, or sign off on the data in your repository. It's more than just, just talking about 
um, some aspect of a new technology in the corporation. Um, it's when those same business and uh, units and leaders begin to ask questions um, that they think can be answered from the data that's or the insight held in repository. So once they begin looking to your data for those answers and they come to you to for that help, that you then have as engagement. And as a bonus, all of a sudden they will start caring about what's in the data because they'll be presenting it from uh, from it. They'll be looking to it for further answers and further analyses. And that's when you really have engagement. Why, so why do we think it's so important? Um, I have a little quote up here from Gartner um, that by 2021, 40% of the organizations will use enterprise architects to help ideate new business innovations made possible by emerging technologies. Uh, this is, I think, a great uh, quotation from a business um, analysis team out there that, that highlights the change of what's going on in the enterprise architecting um, sphere. We're, we used to be the ivory tower, the standards and rules enforcer, which, which eventually just became, for a lot of organizations, including ourselves, obstacles and roadblocks to innovation and change. Um, and you can see that in, in within two years, almost half the organization is going to be looking to a group of individuals in the organization for something else. They want more than just the standards and rules enforcer. They want something, someone to help them innovate, for help them to accelerate um, the business, to, to improve the processes, but also to, to create new ones that can help the organization evolve and keep pace with the ever-changing market that we're in. So we're going to look to enterprise architecture, or I should say we as enterprise architectures can now be uh, architects, can now be partners or consultants. We can be that catalyst for what they're looking for. That's why it's so important. If we can have that engagement, we're, we're now at the table to be that partner and that consultant. So what is our approach to cultivating business engagement? Um, well, there was a handful of things that we did. Um, one of the first things we did is uh, I started listening. What questions were different business units and business leaders asking? We heard questions like, what applications do we have configured for multi-factor authentication? Um, we also heard questions around what would the impact of this change that I'm considering be? We also heard questions uh, like who else uses this process or that application that I'm looking at? I mean, these were questions that, that either weren't being answered at all or they were having significant challenges trying to answer them. And the, all those answers, or sorry, those questions I just listed were ones that we could facilitate with either the tool set that we had at our disposal or the data that we were beginning to collect and curate. We also looked at what, what they were struggling with. Not just what questions they were asking, but what were they struggling with? We had um, some business units saying, well, we've never taken time to document our process. So now the rest of the, the organization thinks that this is a very simple task that we facilitate when actually there's a multitude of manual steps and no one appreciates the complexity of that. Um, we also had people uh, in uh, groups and organizations saying, I have those questions about a, a specific application, but who, who owns it? Who maintains it? I, I don't even know where to even start to look for that answer. Again, both those were, were areas that we could get plugged in. Either we could have or hold that information, or we could help them uh, create that, those views to, to illustrate what they were up against. We also started looking at what data and documents that they were working with. This was an interesting one because we, there's, every organization has a, a multitude of, of data and documentation they're working with. So we, we knew we couldn't um, own this space per se, but we knew that there was challenges in this space. So we found a lot of different groups having uh, no single source that data they were keeping or maintaining. Yes, they could put in a database or, or have a, a data lake or, or leverage tools that were obviously being used, but there was a lot of, uh, peripheral and marginalized data and documents that people are using. And I'll have one example um, in, a, in just a moment about one of those uh, documents that they were challenged with. Finally, what, what are the processes uh, are they creating or were being confined by? We had, for example, as a bank, we're, we're heavily audited and regulated. So there was a lot of different processes that we were being confined by as we grew as, and expanded as a bank, new regulations that we needed to contend with. Uh, and those brought their own multitude of challenges for our organization, some of which we could help and some of which obviously we couldn't. So we just were listening and honed in on where, what processes they were being put on us that we could help with. Lastly, a piece for us was this question, how can the business use what we produce? And Chris mentioned it multiple times from our colleague Charles about that question, like what, what, what question are you trying to answer? Well, this was another one that um, the, all most of our titles, we're not there yet, and so we're not doing the best. Um, I, I, me personally, particularly not doing the best at answering this question, but when I do, there's huge value 
how will the business use what you produce? Because if they're not going to use it or they're not using it in the way they want or they just don't have use for it, then what's the point? At the end of the day, we need to create something that is useful for the business so there's just no point in us getting engaged at all. So let's, let's look at some of these examples that will highlight some of this approach. The first one I want to look at is for our system administration team. Um, our system administration team manages um, all of our core and critical applications. They're not the technical administrators, they're more the operational administrators. Um, they were also best positioned to answer and hold all sorts of critical data elements that we wanted to know about um, those critical and core applications. So it was a huge opportunity for our, our program and our practice to get engaged with these folks. But where did where where could we? Well, one of the questions or one of the things that we saw they were, were being challenged with is that they they had a single spreadsheet that managed the applications that they should manage and the individuals assigned to those applications. Well, this had inherent uh, visibility limitations due to the fact that it was a single file. There was also huge uh, awareness limitations because of it was a single file. Not everyone knew where in the organization to look for that file or where to, to even begin to assess with the data in that file. There was also a challenge with, um, there's multiple managers in this team. And so when a, a person had a question about a specific application, they probably knew that, well, our sysadmin team, you know, will know that I, I need to go to the sysadmin team, but who do I ask? Well, they'll go to the managers and they will, well, who manages that person? So there was already some tools they could use to find that. But a lot of times they were just simply emailing out the first person that came to mind. Well, obviously that might not be the right manager and they would direct them to the right manager. And so that wasted time. And other times they were just simply emailing all of them either at once together or individually. Then you had multiple responses. It just was wasting more and more time. So what did we what did we bring to the table? What did we as an enterprise architecting team uh, do for them? Well, there's a handful of things. We already had the applications. That's where we started. So we already had that in the repository. We also had the employees because we were bringing that in from our uh, our HR tool. What we didn't have was the relationship between those individuals, those employees, and the application. We went to our meta model and looked, is there a relationship that we could leverage for that? And there, there, were, um, there were some that we could, but they, they weren't a great fit. This was a very specific, we wanted to look at who is administering this application. They weren't really the owner, maintainer. There's a couple of things that didn't quite fit. So we decided to create a new relationship between uh, employee or an individual and those applications. One of the reasons we decided to do that is because we wanted to adhere or add a particular property or attribute to that relationship that distinguished between a primary and a secondary administrator. That was a key differentiation factor for this team is that who's the primary and who's are, who are the secondaries? From there, we were able to recreate that spreadsheet uh, inside the Abacus tool, but we're using those relationships, et cetera. Well, we didn't want to just leave it as as a recreation of a spreadsheet uh, in the tool called a catalog, which you can see here at the bottom. We wanted to give them some more uh, analytical tools and insight. So we began to create um, inside Evolution's Enterprise Dashboard, which we see, saw a few other screenshots, but this is a great website that curates that data and displays various artifacts and, 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 and data views that you're creating inside the tool into a more, almost a more consumable format. One of the ways you could do it is from this catalog, we were creating these two uh, pie charts. Uh, the one on the left uh, signified who are the primary system administrators. So that really relied on that the attribute for the relationship. This they kind of knew uh, fairly well. And so you can see each slice was a particular individual and they it would count up, um, sum up how many applications they were administering. So they knew that pretty well. Well, when we created the secondary one, this really highlighted a gap in their understanding. This largest slice over here was was the no value or ones that they had not assigned a secondary administrator to yet. They, I think, knew that they had a, a set of applications they hadn't allocated out secondaries to yet. But once they saw that it was actually almost a third of the application set just did not have a secondary, that just kind of opened up their eyes. Um, and that was a huge uh, win for us in, in regards to the fact that they saw it was more than just a, a replication tool. It was actually giving them insight that they didn't really have before. They could probably do some analysis on that spreadsheet um, that they were always maintaining, but they hadn't yet. And this tool immediately did it from the catalog that we, we created for. How was it used? And that was the question, how, how is the business gonna use it? Well, there's two different ways that they used it. 
one other thing that we did for them was we added all in the secondary catalog tiers. We added all the administrators as well as the, the applications they were primary for. Uh, and we've grayed out obviously uh, a lot of this um, for sensitivity reasons, but we also included their, their working hours, which were more or less time zone specific. This was one where one area where now that this URL was being broadcast out to the team that they could say, well, I need to figure out who's administering this application because I have a set of questions for them. They we could use this site to find that person either by clicking their name or clicking the application down here or even searching for it up in this bar. They would then obviously know the person as well as what time zone they're in or, or more specifically what their working time is. That was huge. That was obviously a great win for the sysadmin managers. They could, we could stop being pestered all the time to figure out who and when people could be contacted. The second way this was used was that the managers themselves now had a common and easy interface to upload and change the data. So they were just sharing the spreadsheet around and they would always have to chase down who's got the latest version, all that kind of normal challenges around a single document. Now they can just come right in here and they can use the catalog we've created for them, add the, the relationships to the catalogs, add the individuals or, or allow that to be imported into the, the, uh, to the database and then connect those to the, the applications. You can change primary to secondaries and you can add that primaries. All that kind of stuff now is done inside this portal. We had the managers using it for day-to-day -day updates and we also had the rest of the business start using it for who to ask questions that, uh, around applications that I, uh, I want to talk about. There's a couple things we learned in that. Quick wins were critical. Look for those quick wins. Um, this particular one about finding the secondary was an accidental one. We didn't realize it was going to be there. We just created the pie chart, which took a matter of seconds, and all of a sudden their eyes lit up. And so that was a quick win to, to get that buy-in. No, they were no longer thinking they're going through the drudgery of a replication effort. And they can see, wow, this is actually going to help us here. And then change isn't bad. There was a handful of iterations that we looked at this for this dashboard itself. The, the team, the sysadmin manager team, didn't really know what they wanted. They wanted to replicate their spreadsheet, which obviously we, we did do and we can do, but there was so much more this tool um, could offer. So we, we, there was a handful of discussions and hey, what do you think about this? And we'd create that and was that helpful? And a lot of things we threw out and a lot of uh, and these handful of things that you can see we kept. Another example was for our email security platform. So our IT operations group was looking at changing our email security solution, but they had a lack of understanding of what uh, was currently being used or where I should say is being currently used, how much of these were being used. And in particularly they were looking at vendors, um, they didn't have a good way of comparing what other vendors were offering to how it might fit into what we currently do or need. So what, you know, what did we do as a team? We, we saw this challenge and we, could, we sat with them uh, and said, I think we can help. We already had the application. So if, as you're looking at this diagram, we, in the end, we created more or less a process diagram. It had all the tasks and gateways and starting points and endpoints here. And the bottom had all the applications. So we had all these applications in our repository. We didn't have this middle layer yet, which I'll touch on in just in a moment. Uh, and no one really had this top layer. So we sat with their SMEs, their, their subject matter experts, and said, well, what's going on to email as it's coming in our organization? And we did a similar one for as it goes out. And we created this. And so this really allowed us to have a, a, a common sheet for us to look at and saying, well, at this point, it's doing this thing, and this application down here is handling that, or that one is, or whatever it might have been. We then needed to abstract between the two. A simple task of saying an email a scan was done by this application. We wanted to abstract so we have a, a common uh, level playing field to compare against other vendors. And so we looked to our meta model to see if there's anything that we could use as an abstraction layer to create that common, uh, that common layer. Um, and we found that there were services. We hadn't been using them very much um, or at all yet. And so we looked at services and by the definition at, offered in that meta model, it, it talked about application level services. And that's more or less what we created here. We, we abstracted away, what is this task or these set of tasks doing? And what is that application offering to the process? And we created these um, application services, which more or less mirrored a technical capability. And that's pretty um, a rough way of translating it. That's how the, the rest of the team, the IT operations team saw it. They saw it as a technical capability, where in fact, it was more of a service the application was providing. From there, we obviously plug them in and now they can see, ah, I see these tasks are being facilitated by that application service or technical capability, which this application is facilitating, but this one's also facilitating that, et cetera. So it all of a sudden created this picture we could work from. From there, we, we created uh, a, a spreadsheet. So we exported this out into a standard Excel spreadsheet. 
that then listed out all those technical capabilities um, or application services that we, as we were using them. And we plugged in what the current solution was doing, or, or I should say what component of the current solution was doing it, whether it was doing it at all or not. We quickly then added to cost information. And then we added what new solution one might look like in terms of what it could facilitate and the cost associated to it, and solution two, et cetera, et cetera. And this tool became um, a great little financial comparison tool and purchasing decision tool. Um, but this was more um, the icing than the cake. The process flows uh, were more the cake. That was the substance that really led to this final view and this final decisioning matrix that we were providing. There's a couple things we learned in this. Um, don't be afraid. I know Chris talked about earlier about extending and maturing into that meta model. We, we hadn't been using services very much yet or at all. And we decided there was, a, there was value in using it for this uh, effort. So we did. And so don't be afraid extending or enhancing or maturing your meta model if there's clear value to do so. Um, another key one was let the business really drive this decisioning. We didn't tell the business which capabilities that they A, wanted or B, were out there. We just helped them identify them and put names to them um, and more or less standardized it. It was them saying, this is what we want or this is what we should call it. That makes sense to me. We didn't really dictate any of that. Lastly, is make sure you, you create visuals. This, this process diagram was used heavily at the beginning and it didn't, wasn't used towards the end, but it really set the picture. It was something that we were able to look at and, and agree. And now it's, it's part of their on, ongoing operational documentation that gets updated and made. Another example was for our IT compliance risk and security team. Um, and this was a great example of what, regular, what, what challenges are being presented, what processes as well, and what documentation can help. As a, a financial institution, we are heavily regulatory, uh, regulated, and we have a lot of audits that we need to facilitate or fulfill. Um, uh, RE2 compliance risk and security plays heavily into that. Um, they wanted to start collecting new criteria um, uh, and they obviously need to store and then report on that new criteria for our applications. Uh, they just didn't have a great means to self-service if you'd like that data. They could, they could obviously collect it in a database or some sort of spreadsheet, but when it came to creating some sort of report from it that was useful for the auditors, they were struggling there as well as the fact that they had a manual process every time they needed to do that. The auditor or uh, regulatory specification had their own set, so they were trying to rebuild each export, if you'd like, to fit those needs. So they had two challenges. They needed some way to, to be able to report, obviously, or provide data in that manner, as well as it needed to be flexible in what, what we were um, creating as reports. We were able to sit with them, and again, we had things already. So we had the applications. That's obviously a common theme for us. That's where we started, so we knew we had that, so we honed in on that area. We were helping people that were application-centric. We also had the ability to add and track that new criteria. You know, that was a fairly simple thing for the, the Abacus tool. We could add properties or, or attributes to the component application. It was really easy for us to do that. It didn't have a great polling mechanism to go out to the owners of those applications and collect that data. So we actually used an in-house tool or a, to a tool that we already had in-house, excuse me, to do that. And that tool uh, collect that data, curated that data. We then took an export of that and imported it right back into Abacus. And that was actually a really simple process for us to do because we more or less dictated with the team what, what the questions we should be, what criteria is being asked. And the format that got put in that other tool, we were able to export it, import it quite quickly. From there, we created this catalog. And obviously this catalog had everything that they cared about, the name, the vendor, the submitter, the, the detailed submitter, all sorts of details, all sorts of questions that they cared about. But we didn't stop there. Uh, we were able to then create uh, a, 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 an enterprise dashboard um, that was used for quick questions. Like who, let's, what are all the applications that Bob the submitter needs to do this year? Or what are all the applications that this executive sponsor needs to supply or, or oversee this year? Um, as well as some new insight that we were able to work with them. They cared a lot about who, what applications have access to credit and debit card details or, or social security and tax ID numbers. So we were able to use these pie charts to bring out some really quick filtering capabilities as well as some analytical tools. So in the end, this was used in two different ways. One being that kind of ad hoc analysis. Uh, so sometimes we would, uh, an executive might wanna know, well, how many applications are touching credit card details? So anybody really that had this uh, URL could simply come in here, click this yes pie chart, and it would filter everything and the catalog underneath would have that number for you. It would be whatever number of applications uh, touch credit card details. 
Another way they could do it is understand, well, who um, this executive sponsor has 14 different people that are, need to review and submit uh, questionnaire information. So they could go back to that executive sponsor and say, you, these 14 people need to do things in this quarter, that type of stuff. So really quick analytical information for that IT compliance risk and security team. The second way it was used was this, this catalog um, has a really simple export functionality from the enterprise tool. Because it had every all the security criteria that they wanted to, to track and, and to share with auditors and regulators, they now, anytime one of them came knocking at the door for information, they were simply coming to this site and exporting this catalog into an Excel spreadsheet. They then gave that Excel spreadsheet in raw format, which was all the same columns and, and rows, et cetera, to them saying, here's all the here's all the data we have under security for our applications. It, it's more than you probably need, but it, it's all here. That was a huge boon for that team. No longer did they have to figure out who had the latest data or, or what questions were being asked by the auditor um, or who can actually supply that information. Uh, they were just simply coming here and exporting that into a spreadsheet and giving it to the regulators and auditors. Last example in this section is our bank wires. So we're looking at considering replacing the applications or, the proce or, or modifying the process of how we handle wires at our bank. It was considering change and, and understanding well, what things would be impacted by that change. You can see from here that there's many different ways a wire transfer starts, and there's also a handful of different ways it finishes. You can see by the different layers or, or streams here that there's different activity going on in different organizations as well as different um, uh, departments and, and teams, etc. What they had a challenge with is that the particular team or department or subject matter expert knew about their layer of this whole cake, but they didn't quite know about the rest of the layers. They might know that there's a handoff up here down to this area, but they didn't know what happened after that. They, they also, no one really had that complete picture basically. So when we sat down with them, we, we see, well, we, we have some of this. We have the applications that are being used, but we don't have is, is we have also have the tools to capture this information that you care about, the process you keep talking about, but we don't, we don't have that process. We obviously sat with them and understood it, sort of documented it out, get their, uh, get their understanding, et cetera, as well as we could then take that and create what we call an application and interface diagram. And this was um, hugely helpful as, a, as a, a subsequent diagram, if you'd like, from the previous. This was able to highlight a few different things. I mean, one of the first things you see is color. So this was one way that we uh, more or less did a heat map of sorts where we applied colors for different reasons. The red indicating that there, there was uh, more or less, these were the items that we were probably gonna change. Either we're gonna replace those applications with something new or that we needed to redevelop them for whatever reason. Um, the yellow were ones that we um, uh, were, were considering for a future change and the green were ones that we're gonna be, we wanted to keep but we're probably gonna be impacted by any of the changes that we were maybe discussing. You can see in this legend over here, it starts talking about that. We also had colors on these dots these dots are simply uh, interface, we call it interface specifications that this application interfaces with this application set using this interface specification. We're actually able to, to indicate, well, this, the green dot's a single directional. So this is more of a, just a simple message exchange. Whereas this one to this one is a bi-directional for that blue dot. There's more data being transferred back and forth in that regard. How was it used in the end? Obviously the, that color coordination was huge. It quickly showed um, a business leaders what was being changed, what would the impact might be, or what other applications would be impacted by those changes. It also created this single canvas or the single pane glass. Everyone, all parties involved could come and see that, oh yeah, I oversee this application and what's going on between these two, but I didn't realize these other things were involved. It obviously gave executives and directors the whole complete picture as well to understand all the different places that this change would impact. And this is obviously critical for cross-team projects, you know, these kind of views. And, and a lot of times, are, I would imagine all organizations struggle with having those, those complete pictures where the tool um, can, can facilitate that as well as we as enterprise architects can help build that and then highlight really insightful data like the, the color mapping. This will obviously lead to, to new things. I mean, this was a, a, a kind of a precursor to an impact analysis. At, we're, we're planning on doing similar ones, but with evolved architecture which I'll highlight as an example in the next section. But this is just one way to evolve. And that's one thing that we learned in this is that try different tools. With the heat map was great Tim, to show change and impact, but it wasn't the only option available. Let's look at self-circuit architecture shortly. Um, and we'll talk about why is it so important to us and what does it actually mean? What does it look like? Um, uh, 
why is it intrinsic for our future, and a couple examples in that. So what does it look like? So here I have a couple of different diagrams um, for, uh, sorry, diagrams from pictures uh, of different examples, from boarding a plane to ordering your fast food to getting your groceries. This really highlights what it is. It's intrinsic to our future, it's just out there. It's engaging, it's diverse, it's interactive, it's intuitive, it's accessible. But it's also important to note what it's not. It's not comprehensive. You can't, uh, you can't get your Thanksgiving turkey and board your plane at the same time. There is different, different focuses for different places for different times. It's not inconvenient. If you have an inconvenient self-service tool, no one's gonna use it. So why is it critical for our future? Well, this is our, this is our dashboard that we use for our, um, uh, our self-service tool. Again, this is the enterprise um, uh, tool itself. We created it as our front door. You can see there's different departments um, that they would click on to get into their uh, aspect, but it was it, it just improved the speed because now people can get to the data they want to and it's curated for them. There's a parallel effort going on uh, in the bank um, for across all banking industries, oh, sorry, um, uh, marketplaces is transitioning from a an in-branch visit to the more mobile and, and, and online visits. Well, this is also the same for us. We don't want uh, business leaders and business units coming to our office, um, uh, knocking on the door and asking for data. We want to put that data and that information at their fingertips. So there was a huge parallel for what we were trying to achieve as a team to what, the, what our organization was trying to achieve. One of those areas was we were developing uh, additional SaaS platforms and trying to see, as we developed those, we knew there were reusable components. But we didn't always understand where those reusable components would be. So in this diagram, we can see there's a, there's a process flow for that, that application uh, and there's an application set down here, but we didn't have these two middle layers at the time. So we, after sitting with them, we said, well, we've got your applications, you've got a process flow from a third party, we'll recreate it in our tool and we'll start doing some things to help you understand the reusability. So what we did is we used the meta model again, found out that services again is a great place to, to use and leverage. And we did two different layers of services, a business layer that might highlight really broad things like uh, uh, client verification or account on o opening or something of that nature. And then really specific services, uh, these are integration specific services. In. This allowed us to really abstract between just a simple task and a flow up here down to applications down at the bottom. And what this did is we went to the next application, we would design out this kind of process flow and say, well, we need another account opening um, uh, service. Well, business units could see that we have that here. Let's just do the same thing that we did last time. Created a common uh, uh, language so our business units could live up in these top two layers and our developers and our application teams could live in these bottom two layers. And the combined picture, all of a sudden you had a common language they were speaking. This is a great example of our almost. We're not quite there yet. This isn't heavenly used. We're still developing it. But again, um, uh, don't be afraid to leverage that meta model to find things that work for a business value that you have a clear value to define. Another example of this evolved architectures I talked about a little bit before, Chris obviously talked about it more. This is an example of one of those. On the left here is we had the existing architecture for our branch network structure. We wanted to change that in our future uh, network architectures. We leveraged evolved architectures to, to highlight and create what a possible uh, future option one would be and what would a possible future option two would be. We had all the circuits, we had the applications, the IT operations team just didn't have an effective means to create these diagrams accurately and inform the decision makers of those changes. So with that said, we were able to sit with them, understand the changes, create them in an evolved architecture, one here and a second one here. And we then used the enterprise tool, that website, to, to pull from three different architectures, the current and a possible future one and possible future two, and display all three on the single pane of glass. Obviously, this was hugely helpful at first as a reference point of, for IT operations to understand, well, what circuit's gonna connect where in this potential, potential future option? We then embedded even cost analyses into it for each object, so you could see as things were changing or, or, or adding things, you could see that, that cost change as we went forward. Another example is for our Microsoft 365 consideration. We had um, uh, our IT, again, our IT operations sat down with us and say, there are so many things going on in Microsoft 365. There's so many features, so many capabilities, so many different licensing. We need help trying to understand that, you know, digest all that information, et cetera. So we had a big whiteboarding session, which you can see here on the left. And it was a great session. We talked about various places that things could be used, what data uh, we cared about, what, what capabilities we cared about, when they're being rolled out, what packages and what licensing, et cetera. 
but this whiteboard is all of them are going to be pretty static to almost gain that same value you would almost have to sit through the whole section all over again and understand the lines and why they were drawn the way they were as well as you couldn't you couldn't move things around it was all static and so there's a huge challenge around that this was a great challenge for our ea team because we didn't have really any of this data they weren't really applications they weren't um anything uh, component wise that we could leverage so we had to look at our metamol again saying what could we use um, to help answer the questions of how do we use it, when do we use it, when, when do we want to use it. But in the end, we actually created a new component, and we called it technology. And that's what um, we used heavily to uh, um, exemplify and illustrate a particular part of the Microsoft 365 roadmap. From there, we created this dashboard that had all sorts of intrinsic and, and value into that. From here, we could create all sorts of things. And this was a, probably our best example of self-service. We had different licensing modules that the colors mapped up. We created a bubble chart that in, in indicated when we were gonna implement certain technology or when we hoped to. We had uh, a wish, wish list down here. You know, what was our IT operation manager actually care about? There's a whole slew of things where we didn't care about. There's things that we did. What was the, what were the feature sets we currently don't have? What's the cost associated to them? So this pie chart was cost. So this biggest slice was the most expensive and these other ones there. It became a really interactive place for people to ask certain questions. What are the tool sets we're gonna implement from this group in this year? What are the things that bring us the most value? We, we did a, a, an enterprise value analysis and a deployment risk analysis. This was able to answer a huge amount of questions. And it was probably, again, our best example of what was self-service. The teams were able to come here to figure out and get interactive answers to a numerous sets of questions they didn't even know what they wanted to ask. They would answer one question and realize they had another. There's a handful of things that we learned across this whole process. One, you gotta find ways to get in the door. What documents or data are they referencing frequently? What questions are they, are, are they challenged to answer? Um, what are the business units struggling with? Those are all things that we were listening for that we then piped up and tried to answer and help them with. Um, going back to that quotation uh, from Chris's segment about not, not all of them are, are, some of them are helpful and everything's accurate. Focus on what is helpful. Hone in on that. Or if the, people aren't using the stuff you're providing, focus on different areas. If they don't care about the answers you're providing, ask different questions. Um, and, and probably the biggest part here is use interactive tools. That enterprise tool has been a huge boon for our team because it's interactive. You can ask different questions, you can engage with that data in a different way. So that was a, probably a great one to, uh, to enforce. Make sure that tool, whatever one you're picking is interactive. So Luis, I'm gonna pass it over to you for some Q&A. Hey, excellent. Thanks, thanks so much guys, Chris and Tyson, that was great. Um, I'm gonna go, come straight to the questions now because there are quite a few in here, you've got some uh, good ones in here. Um, so I'm going to try and combine a couple of these. Um, so one of the questions that uh, that's a theme that's coming up here is, you know, you mentioned that at the start you you, know, you, you started from a maybe a small example. You kind of built out from that. I, I guess the, the first theme that I'm noticing here is what what um, how did you choose exactly where to start? Like, why specifically the use case that you chose um, and not another one that might have been presented to you or that might have been at the right time? I mean, so we, we talked heavily about, we, we started with applications um, and, you know, applications are really something in, in common uh, between the technology side of the business and the, and the business side of the organization. So that was a really good point for here's, Here's where they intersected, and we could we could pull good information. I think the question I'm hearing is more about, you know, what do you start with? Um, and initially, we had several competing spreadsheets around what are our most critical applications. So that was a, a great opportunity for us to start because there was a, a business need for, hey, we need to understand between all the business units what are our truly core critical applications. And that was one of the areas that we started. But the theme here that Tyson really dug into is, what are the questions that the business is asking for? What's important to them? And that's where we focused. And, and just to add to that, Luis, I, there's a lot of questions that we were being asked that we just simply couldn't help with. So it, honing on the ones that you know your team can answer or you have the data for, or you have the tool set to answer it is, is also critical. And just to add, I mean, our application set, one thing I, I know we touched on was that we found it was a common language across the organization. We had business owners talking about it. We had technical folks talking about it. 
applications. So it was a common place for us to start that we knew we could get wins on both sides. And I did want to point out this this LinkedIn group. If you know we don't get to your question or you're watching or recording this presentation, we're definitely planning on monitoring that group to answer any questions that pop up there. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, uh, we certainly will. Um, I, I think uh, the theme that I'm that I'm hearing there is is that is that you really were paying attention to kind of the common words, common things that people were talking about. And then, and then in the end, you weren't shy to tackle some low hanging fruit. You knew that applications were available somewhere. Um, so you, you hit those. Um, so the next thing is after you've kind of identified some initial data and you identified some questions that you were going to tackle and, and you were starting to get some engagement from your, your uh, customers, how did, you, how did you handle or how are you handling now the increased demand on you guys uh, or on your team? How are you handling that? I all, you know, it, it's it's an everyday uh, battle. I mean, sometimes there's there's more being asked of us that we can deliver. Other times that, you know, we're still trying to find engagement with certain business units. I mean, there's still a lot of um, areas that we can improve upon in, in different groups we can engage with. Um, there's just some of it we just know that we can tackle. You know, again, there's areas that are are um, are areas that we want to grow in, so we can focus on those. Uh, and there's other areas that we just help with what we can, um, uh, but we don't engage fully on. Yeah, and I think there's something to be borrowed from the your, your model is never perfect. Um, it, there's definitely been some requests that we've had to go back and go. You know what? We don't we don't have good enough information. We don't have good enough data. We'd love to help you with that problem, but we don't. That's not something that we're equipped to to deal with at this time. Are you are you able to say that uh, to folks, or do you kind of let them let them continue and then and then get back to them after they ask you the third time? How how does that work? No, no, I I think we've got good support um, from our management team to to be able to say, hey, you know, we want to give we want to provide value. If if we go into something completely blind with bad information, the chances of provide us providing value are small. So, um, you know, I don't think we really hesitated to to say no. Uh, okay, we've got a question on on the dashboards uh, that you guys have built. Are you guys finding that the people accessing the dashboards are able to understand them on their own, or do you find that you have to introduce your audiences to those dashboards? I, that's a fantastic question. I think, um, and there are some aspects that you know are, are pretty intuitive. They can, but I think pretty much every case we do a walkthrough and a sit down with those those units and those individuals. It's just there's it, there's so many things that you can do and how it can be used that um, that just need are best done in person. So yeah. yeah, we are sitting down with people and explaining what the dashboard is, how you can use it, what it can do for you. Yeah, and a lot of these these dashboards we're creating for a specific audience. So we take the time to sit down with the audience and go, hey, does this work? Does this not work? What can we do different? That that's just part of the iteration. Uh, another question on some, some of your early uh, your early slides there, where you were, uh, you had your kind of catalogs and and you had all these. I think one of them had uh, the different survey results. Did you um, did you have any metrics that you calculated using algorithms? We did. So um, on the the Microsoft 365 analysis um, that we did, there was a catalog that we came up with some computations that we wanted to do for enterprise value and deployment risk. We sat with our CIO and um, director of enterprise um, technology and uh, strategic development and, and found out what weighting we should do on the various questions we were asking to, to create an enterprise value and deployment risk. From there, we used visual algorithms inside the Abacus tool to calculate what the kind of aggregate value or risk for those technologies would be. So that was one, one example. And we were able to do that with the visualization tool. So there was no coding involved. There was no scripting. We were able to just create it and have it run every time it was saved, for example. Do you find yourself having to explain that algorithm to, to folks who are reading the, the, you know, the output from it? Or, or is, it, is it something that because you worked with them, they know what's there? And they, can... yeah, they definitely needed to understand where that came from. Obviously, we collected a lot of data from the IT managers and the, the SMEs specifically around those categories that the algorithm ran against. So they understood there was some computation going on, but yeah, the weighting, for example, you know, we, we did explain, you know, so this, this particular ca uh, category has this 20% weighting and that one has a 30% weighting and that one has a 10% weighting. So those simple metrics were, were needed for them to appreciate, well, how did you get to that final risk or that final value? 
Okay, I'm gonna ask, uh, try to squeeze one more in here. Um, do you have any any particular stories or any you know maybe moments where uh, some kind of anecdote from from your from your experience uh, through this journey where uh, where you notice that yep you know we, we just surmounted a massive hurdle or 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 there's some you know kind of light bulb moment if you will. Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a couple that come to mind, but one, when when the, the enterprise dashboard came out and we were able to create really quick analytical objects of the data we were already holding and, and curating and, and providing, um, like this Microsoft 365 dashboard, that was, that was a game changer for us. All of a sudden it became interactive, which was a huge part of our self-service um, kind of goal, as well as it was uh, intuitive. Uh, once they understood the kind of layout and how it worked, um, it was uh, convenient, you know, it was accessible. All of a sudden these things started ticking in place. So that, that was a huge moment for us to be able to provide that. And we started leveraging it heavily. You can also create that, that kind of front door view that we saw before that had the various department buttons on it. That, that was a huge part. We used the same tool to do that as we did, you know, the various pie charts and all that sort of good stuff. Thanks so much, Chris. Moment. That's perfect. No, thanks so much, Chris uh, and Tyson. Tyson, thanks so much. Uh, I think that works. That works for us, and especially since we're at two o'clock. You've lived up to my expectations. My high expectations. The high bar is set for you guys. Appreciate you guys <laughs> Actually. Being, the, being the last presentation. Um, and thank you all for joining us for our first annual uh, Digital Enterprise Architecture Summit. Uh, of course, we're delighted with the high level of interest that um, that everyone's shown in this event. So, um, you know, we're really excited that we had a great line of of EA experts from around the world, literally. Uh, presenting uh, pre presenting all their experiences and techniques, missions, best practices, all around enterprise architecture. Um, I think it's been a great success, and uh, I, I know that you guys agree with me. Um, you've shown it by your participation. Um, so uh, I guess just one final note, and Chris has already made it. Um, if you're interested in keeping uh, any of this conversation going, anything that, that you've seen from the uh, these presentations, um, anything you've seen during the summit, uh, go ahead and join that LinkedIn group that uh, that is highlighted on on that uh, was on that last slide. Um, yeah, there it is at the bottom. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, and uh, we're happy to continue it there. Um, once again, thanks to all the presenters. Thank you, especially Tyson and Chris. Uh, really appreciate your time, and thank you to all the uh, all the attendees. It's great success. Thank you.